This is a production of Cornell University. I'm Lutie Salisbury, and I'm from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Um, I am the head of the chemistry biochemistry library, and I'm doing and the liaison for AGNIC. Um, this morning, my, um, my presentation is comparing the CABI database with the EBSCO um, Tourism and Hospitality Index. How about, is there anyone here from CABI? No? Um, EBSCO? No? OK. Um, uh, pardon me? Oh, OK. Well, they don't want to come. <laughs> they might not want to. I said not. Oh, um, so I will give in my um, in my presentation. I'll tell you why I did this this evaluation. I'll talk a little bit about the, pro the two products um, or method that we use for the analysis, and and then I'll talk about the critical evaluation and what we found from the um, from doing this um, evaluation. Um, as you know, um, as librarians in our respective disciplines. We should be concerned about subscribing to the best resources to satisfy our users. Um, of course, as we know, most of our libraries do not have unlimited resources that we can subscribe to the same information repackaged in, in, in a way um, and then supplied by different vendors. Um, also, we have in academia, we have this um, and, and more, we have to uh, accountability to give accountability and to provide unique opportunities. Provide unique opportunities for us to focus on evidence-based librarianship. And one of the areas we can do this is in collection assessment. Um, also, with the amount of free roofs resources on the internet, some very useful ones like Google Scholar, a strong competitor to many of our resources. Um, it becomes imperative that as information professionals, we should be thoroughly engaged and knowledgeable in the resources we offer our users. And hence, if we do this collection assessment, we should be able to, be, we should be able to make a difference in the products we offer to our users. Um, also, if we should be focusing on the added value that we receive from this database. Um, you know, we do have um, Google Scholar, and as I say, it's a strong competitor to many of our databases. So we should be able to get from these databases things that are beyond Google and Google Scholar for our users. And another major contributing factor for this study is that I want to bring to attention the librarians working in this field, the scope of the CABI database and the coverage of information that it has in this area. So the... Um, the CABI Ledger Tourism Abstract, um, I'm sure that many of you know what it is. It's a standalone database on the web. And it's produced by CABI, and it uses the CABI interface. Um, it has records from 1976 to date, and it is updated weekly. This database is also available as a subset of that big CAB database that we all subscribe to. And, um, and it, as you know, that's available from several vendors as well. Um, institutions that subscribe to the CAB database, we can isolate this section from this section ID and sort within that to get this, this valuable resources that we have. Um, and also from now on, I'll be referring to the CABI, this database as the CABI database and to the EBSCO host database as EBSCO host um, because I'll be talking about them in and out. Um, the, this database, and for some countries around the world is also available in a printed quarterly abstract for those who it's relevant for. Um, the EBSCO um, database, it's a scholarly, it's, it has scholarly research material and it's a bibliographic database. They are, bibliographic database, they also have a full text version, but this one is comparing the two bibliographic databases. Um, and it covers research material, industry news, relating to all areas of hospitality and tourism. And it's, of course, published by EBSCO Publishing. This database um, covers these three collections. 
It brings its three collections together. And this first collection um, was not produced by Cornell University, was not publicly available before this. And of course, there's the University of Surrey, and then this one was produced by, by Purdue University. This brings together all three in one place. The, um, the method, how did we do this? The first, um, we, did, we, we used a three-prong approach to do for this methodology. We downloaded the list of um, journals from the different website, actually not journals, the list of materials they cited on the website. And um, these were used to, um, to identify overview, um, the overlap and uniqueness of the different databases. Um, the titles were then checked against each database. To, 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 to verify the number of records in the databases and then to identify currencies. So we restricted for the whole database and then restricted for the last six years um, to see um, the, the coverage in it. Then we used the Ulrich's um, web global directory so as to verify the type of material that these journals um, cover, whether they were academic journals, whether they were magazines, news, or whatever. Um, and so, you know, upfront, I'll say, is not um, a project for the faint of heart. It takes a lot of time to do. But it's, it, at the end, we did have some useful information that we can make decision of one or the other database. Um, here is a summary of what the database, um, of the two different databases, and I'll be talking to this. So, um, some of you might not be able to read this, but that's fine. Um, the CAB abstracts cover over 128,000 records overall in the database, and it has, it adds approximately 10,000 records each year. And most of the records, of course, we all know in the CAB abstracts has informative abstracts and thorough indexing in the, in the database. Um, the scope of the CAB database and the specific area is domestic and international, with majority of the publications in English. It does have other languages, other languages as well, as you can see the percentage, the percentage here. Um, in this section here includes about 3,000 plus full text articles that are hosted in a CABI full text repository. We know that the CAB database has all those links to the full text um, thing, and there are about 2,000 records for the CAB CABI eBooks chapters. Um, the articles identified as full text are those coming from journals and conference papers which CAB has permission to host the PDF and some of them are open access. They also have links to open access material, it is not hosted. Um, now a browse of the document types in the, in the database, in, in the CAB database, um, found 104, uh, over 100,000 records which are coming from academic, academic, journal, academic articles, actually, it's classed as. Um, and these, you can see that there are um, over 10,000 book chapters, over 10,000 conference material, um, a few magazine articles, and it lists as 100 dissertation, 199 dissertations. Um, of the 100,000, plus 100,000 plus record material there. Many of these are, has a dates between 92 and 2012, and 46% of this material was for the last six years. That's the, the currency. And although they list the books chapters and the, uh, the books and book chapters and conference papers separately, some of them, there is an overlap. So when you order these two together, there are about 18,000 unique records in here um, for these years. Of course, like I say up front, all the records in this database, they have substantial articles, substantial papers. They can, might be coming from journals or they might be coming from conference papers or they might be chapters in books, but they're all substantial material cover. Um, if we look at the, um, in the book, in the book, limiting to book as a publication type in the database, they, uh, there are about 3,000 book, um, book titles listed in here. Um, and 18% of them, were for the last six years. There were 199 dissertations and thesis, but this is by no means comprehensive. So if students in this, or researchers in this area really need dissertation, they need to check other sources like WorldCat and ProQuest dissertation or all those other free resources on the web. Case study was not listed as a, as a publication type in the CABI database, but for comparative reasons, I did search for um, case studies as a subject 
our descriptor in here and found that there were nearly 7,500 case studies. And actually, they are substantial. Um, they do have substantial case studies when they are listed as a subject or descriptor in the CABI database. The EBSCO host um, Hospitality and Tourism Index, which I'll refer to as EBSCO host, they include and um, they include more than um, eight, eight, overall in this database, they include more than 800,000 articles um, and several bibliographies and biographies as a list in the publication type. Now, a faceted, when I, when you, I use the faceted display in this database, and, and um, the display showed that there are 854, um, 854, when you add up all these, there are 854,000 citation articles, and most of them are coming from the top categories are trade publications, magazines, um, book chapters, book reviews, case studies, as you can see that there are case studies, company reports, uh, country reports, and um, I'll talk to each one of these as we go down because I was more concerned in what are these things that are in this database that's different and why, you know, the whole scope of it. Um, they, um, now, if you look at the, the unique things that the substantial number of trade publications, the, the nearly 400,000, it showed that there are 17 titles in here, and these are the 17 top titles, contribute to 74% of this big number of material that are there. And in magazines, 17 titles contribute to 39%. The other thing is, you, uh, there are many cases, or there are times when you find that both that the same publication is indexed as a trade publication as well as a magazine. So if you're really doing this, it's not the final number because like, you know, they, uh, for what reason, many databases do that to index things in two different places for you to get it. Um, for the um, reports that um, are in this database, they, they, there are 9, 000, over 9,000 reports but they are coming from four major sources. One, like that economic, the business monitor market, and notice this one. There's 101 entries coming from one book that was published in 2012. So, I mean, they could be, you know, they are, it's a business related thing. It's not really the academic thing. So that's, you know, the, that's the reports in newspapers. The dates are, that's the dates. And then you, there are three major resources, three major sources, the New York Times, Wall Street, and New York, the New York Stri Late Edition, and the New York Times Front Page Morning Editions. So the, you know, even though it's listed as a substantial number of resources, some of, the, some of them are, it might be useful for business aspect of this, but they're not substantial resources. The um, books. The years that the books are in here, it's, it's from 1991 to 2008. And if you notice, two books, 57% of this material is for this from, came from this book, which is nearly 747 entries. And, and this one in this, in this has 7% of the entries. So two books in here has contributed to a large number of the citations on the books. Um, in biographies, there are two, these are mainly the, the biographies are listed. It's not like substantial bibliographies that we know, but they are, they are from articles that have substantial bibliographies, like review articles or whatever. Um, the company reports is a, a much more substantive, um, is that there, are, there is a SWOT analysis from 50 countries, um, ranging from 2003, industry and market reports. There are 74 industry and market reports, and there is a large percent that are more recent. Um, country reports, there are a lot from 130 countries, the reports, and with 34% um, in the last six years and 2% for 2012. So this is the country reports are more, but we know that we can find country reports in many more places, right? Um, now, the, um, you, the, the overlap within these two databases is 99 journals. And for the 99 journals that, uh, that we have as the um, overlap, if you notice that there are the, dis the, the discrepancy in the number of our total articles that we have here, um, of this, um, they have, um, EBSCO host has a bit more than, I think of course, with all the um, 
trade publications and the magazines, I mean, it's, it's a substantial number, but um, if we look at discrepancy we can, uh, from here, we see this is relating to the, journal, the journals itself. Um, EBSCO host includes book reviews, substantial book reviews, which is also a useful resource if you're doing collection development and for our um, for our researchers if they wanted to find books and find a review. Um, Kabi Abstracts does not include book reviews. Um, the other thing is that in Kabi Abstracts, the, in the major database, they index cover to cover. Every article index cover to cover and only the substantial ones that are relating to this area is tagged in that section. And I was researching with that section of the, of the database. Um, and then of, um, if you notice also um, in, in, um, in the EBSCO host database, they include some peripheral materials with a substantial number of articles in it. Whereas in the CABI, CABI index, the same thing, but they don't have the, that total number of records in this section, but they have it in the total database. Um, in, in, the, in the, the journals that are indexed in both, in, the, in EBSCO host, there are 50, 50 unique titles, and five of these cease publication according to Ulrichs. Um, they have, this is the total number of records they have, and for the last six years, there are 48%. The CABI database indexes 505 records. What I forget to say is that these have more than, the ones that with, with more than 10 articles for this period of time, that's what's covered here. Um, anything that, that indexes less than 10 articles is not in here. Um, and they, uh, this, the, for the CABI database has, from this 505 journals, they have 35,000 records and they have 59% that, um, that is more recent. Now the differences in the, um, in the different databases is that EBSCOhost is only available in um, true EBSCOhost as a vendor. Um, and it's, it's also, um, the CABI is available electronically as we said in, as a standalone and in, is part of CAB abstracts and, in, 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 and, and through several vendors. Um, for subscribers who are subscribing to the full database, it might be for you know it might be difficult for our end users to remember that this is this whole lot of material in this database that you could use in this area, um, and, and so uh, there may be and also it's, it even for us when I was trying to keep to isolate the section all the time and work with it it was not easy so um, our end users might not know but still if they search the complete database. They will still find all this material and find more material in the database. Um, we might be, you know, one way that we can do this is put it in our lib guides, you know, when we are doing for this subject area and then describe how to get to it and bring it as a resource, as a top resource in the subject area that users will know that we have this in there. Um, in the CABI database, they have 25 fields for searching. And it searched, you know, it's a, it's, it's a real good database to search. And you could, it has 25 access points, so it's easier to search. It's a research type material. However, in the CABI, the CABI database does not include fields for company and industry research, because they are more academic and research type material, like company material or tick, the ticket symbol and things like that. The EBSCO host, um, of course, is a standalone database, and um, it does, while this database, if you, someone was to purchase this as an index, it doesn't have full text. Like I say, there is a full text version which is substantially more expensive. That. Um, however, there's an advantage for this database if you do subscribe to it, because many of our libraries subscribe to other EBSCO host databases for our undergraduate users, like you know the Academic Search Premier or Business Source Complete that some our libraries do subscribe to. So if it's on this platform, then you know you can link all this together in search, and you bring then you can get those full text to the users. And we know that the undergraduate student all they want is full text material, right? So it's a good way if you do subscribe to this database. Um, this database has 16 fields only. Um, you know it's not a scholarly database like 
cap abstracts is, but it does have things that you can do industry, industry and, and country reports and things like that, with the, you know, ticker symbol, done number, and all those kinds of um, company information. Um, and so now I'll, I'll talk about a little bit searching, um, do general searching in the database with broad, broad searching to identify what's the um, differences in them. And in, in if I, a search in, um, for hospitality industry, as a, sorry, I did, I went to one. Oh, no, a search for, for ecotourism in, 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 the, in the databases. Um, in CABI um, database, we did have about 3,000. In EBSCOhost, we had only 3,000 more records. And 3,000 more records, it's not a substantial amount since there is, and here has 800,000 records from all sources. I was surprised that there was more than 300 different records in here. However, um, in, in, this, in the, the CABI database, we have it on the EBSCO, EBSCO host platform. And so I could have linked to it to all our other full text databases that we subscribe to. And from when we did that, there were 327 full text articles that were duplicated in, the, in these databases. And, um, and there was 146 full text, which was unique to the CAB database because that's not in the EBSCO host database. And of course, you can refine by many other different things. From the EBSCO host, when I did the same thing, um, because of um, the database, because we do have that as well, we unlink it to the, all the other subscribed database. There were six, seven or six records that were full text. There were no copy. And then they have those different fields to search. Um, when I search for the hospitality industry, because it has, the industry part is more prevalent in um, EBSCO than in CAB. Um, we get um, there are this amount of records, and notice they are from primarily academic sources. In EBSCO host, of course, there's the industry aspect. We get plenty more, and the trade publications, magazine, academic journals, if you compare it, there is more in the CAP database. Reports in books, there are more in the CAP database, if you search it as a in, uh, hospitality industry. Um, the other thing that I did was to search to see you know, I'm um, trying to find authors from Cornell University. And so in the CABI database, like being it's a research database, so there is an affiliation field. Without affiliation field, I will not be able to do my job to, to convince people that here is publication from a university. Good database in this CAB, you know, to search it there. It's easy and it tells us, you know, with the faceted display, you could tell where this is coming from. In, in this database, there is no affiliation field. And so it's a major weakness. And, and in, in some of these databases as well, you cannot search by author, actually. And so um, in, in the help, it did say is that you can search in a command search to get this stuff. The command search I did, and I don't think users, our users nowadays, will not go to the command search and learn this stuff unless they really want this research. I mean, faculty might learn it, graduate student might learn it, but the undergraduate student will not. And so that only gave, when I did a command search, according to what they're describing in the help in the back, it did, you know, the records. I mean, when I did an all text search, which I think that that was the aim of this stuff, that users will search, like Google, you know, there were um, 446 records, but there is no way, when I looked at the records, many of them are, were from Cornell authors, but there is no way of, taking out the ones that were not Cornell authors from it. So it's a bit difficult to search. I mean, whether this is for an undergraduate student, you know, how are undergraduate students search this time is not a problem. But if you're really doing, you know, those kinds of searches that 21st century science librarians are doing these days for professors, it will be a problem because we have to sit there and take out every one that's not from our university if you were using that. If you were trying to use this to, you know, help with that kind of analysis which faculty Nowadays, once. In um, conclusion, um, the CABI database, of course, includes scholarly material from a broad range of academic scholarly journals in this area. Um, and they comprehensively index everything in the CAB database, and they only link the ones, maybe they need to do some more better linking to this section. Um, most of the records, or nearly all of them in the CABI database, have all these good indexing, abstracting, all the fields to search, whatever. Um, the records also have a broad range of conference papers that's not anywhere else in this area, that they collect the conference papers, and 
I mean, uh, they do have a broad range, not, it's not comprehensive. Um, the libraries that subscribe to Cobb Abstracts already, I don't think they should do anything else. They, they, they shouldn't be subscribing to this section. Um, there is a wealth of information, and if this is complemented with access to the databases, business database that the library already subscribed to, and many of our libraries, certainly in the US, I know, are business departments, and we do have the EBSCO source premier, we have the ProQuest ABI, and also there are specialized databases that you study industry kinds of things, like value lines, and the S&P um, Net Advantage, and Mergent Online, and all those different databases, they have all that industry information. So. We will, if you do have those, then the, the CAB abstract with those might suffice to support a research program or an undergraduate instruction in this area. For the EBSCO host um, records, they include a smaller number of academic journals, but the ones that they index, they seem to do it comprehensively, and they cover it cover to cover. Um, greater emphasis in this database is placed in the area of hospitality and tourism rather than on recreation. CAP database recreation is more prominent information there. Um, while this, the EBSCO host does not index a lot of books, they do have substantial book reviews that is important for our undergraduate students if they are to write, you know, sometimes they have to write book reviews and whatever. And also for researchers, if researchers are trying to find books then they can go there and find books, and for us librarians, because if you're trying to build a comprehensive collection and somebody's done a review, I mean, it helps us when we are trying to buy things in this area. Um, they include a substantial number of records from magazine, of course, you've seen that, trade publications, country reports, SWOT analysis, and, and um, industry reports. However, if your library has already subscribed to these resources in all these other business resources, um, then this might be a duplication um, in, in effort. And um, certainly it's um, th this database, if library has not subscribed to the CAB database or to other business resources, then this is a database that you can find, that you can study the industry, you can find substantial information to study the industry as well as it has a core set of journals that you can do research, an undergraduate student can use as a standalone database to do research in its area. And um, if you want more information, this is published as a paper in Charleston and Pfizer, so. And I think we'll take questions at the end, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you for sure. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Uh, uh, my name's Jeannie Fander, and I'm presenting for the paper that was uh, uh, co-authored by, as you can see here, Barbara Hutchinson in the audience, and Valeria Pesce as well, and then our colleague uh, back in Tucson at the University of Arizona, Matt Rahr. And uh, today I'm gonna be uh, presenting on the project that we have been working on for many years, uh, the, the, which has changed over the years and, and we'll describe how, how that has changed. Uh, this may be a review, at least for some of you uh, who've been involved in AGNIC or USAIN, but uh, because we've made some presentations uh, on, on this program or project, uh, on the rangelands project in the past, but uh, we have new developments to report. But as a review of our history, we uh, started back in 1995 as one of the founding or charter members of AGNIC, uh, led by the National Agricultural Library. And uh, it, our effort at Arizona, at the University of Arizona in Tucson, has from the beginning been a partnership of both librarians, IT specialists, and, and scientists, rangeland specialists. So uh, we've, we've all, from the very beginning, made that a focus of how we do our work, working as a team. Uh, we, we began as sort of the Arizona Rangelands Project. That was our topic for our, our state uh, initiative. 
but quickly realized that you know this was something that didn't stop at political boundaries. That rangelands were a, 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 a land type that was found around the world. Uh, you know, certainly around the Western U.S. And uh, so it wasn't long before we started working with other states, uh, began to expand the, the effort to be a partnership, not just in Arizona between uh, librarians and rangeland specialists, but with other states. And, and eventually, uh, as you can see, uh, we've gone global and, and are involving or working with partners in other countries as well. So again, uh, over time, uh, in in 2001, we, we uh, developed the Western Rangelands Partnership, uh, which is composed of uh, uh, 19 land-grant universities involved in that initiative. And uh, then more recently, uh, Australia, uh, Sonora, Mexico, the state of Sonora in Mexico, and the Food and Agricultural Information uh, Organization, Food in agricultural FAO, and uh, we are also looking to work with other uh, international groups, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But from the very beginning, uh, w we were focused on having as much full text content as available as we could. And one of the first projects uh, when we began in the mid '90s was to digitize the the. Uh, scholarly journal of the Society for Range Management, the uh, Journal of Range Management. And that was facilitated through funding uh, from, from GSA, the General Services Administration. Uh, again, I think because of our participation in NAGNIC, that was made possible. And uh, so we, we did the digitization in-house at uh, the University of Arizona, a real learning experience and uh, made that available as the first full text content uh, collection that, that we offered through uh, our Rangelands project. Uh, since then, we also received some funding through a cooperative agreement funds uh, through NAL and digitized the journal or Rangelands, which is also a Society for Range Management title. These are archival uh, back files. We, we are, not up to date. We, we had been working on sort of a rolling window basis and are currently in negotiation with SRM and uh, Allen Press as to how and when and if maybe we can continue that addition of content on a rolling window basis. So that's sort of in progress. So this kind of gives you a sense of what the site looked like after we went to that regional collaboration, uh, and so you'll see a, a contrast in a, a few slides for what we are looking uh, like now, but uh, in any case, uh, we, as all groups do, I think, or at least hopefully do, recognize uh, that you can't do a project and that's it. It's always a ongoing uh, work of, you know, in progress, and so, we, in, the, in 2008, we decided that we needed to uh, really take a look at what our users were looking for. We did a needs assessment, did focus groups with uh, range scientists, with ranchers, with librarians, uh, you know, the, any, uh, as a wide range of users that we could get to talk to us in, in a, focus groups in different states, and uh, we, we conducted that needs assessment uh, effort. We also subsequently, the following year, used that information to work up a business plan. Uh, and all of this was with the idea that it would inform the technical requirements to, uh, to do a total redesign of, the, of what we were doing, what, how we presented the information on the web. And so the key recommendations, I think, are common to many web projects, uh, nothing totally mind-boggling here. Uh, users want content to be active and updated. Uh, they want to be able to search quickly and, and get relevant results. Uh, and of course, again, the full text content, the, the documents and images that they can get uh, right there at, uh, 
when they do the search are important. Uh, I think especially in agriculture and uh, for people on the ground doing uh, land management, uh, either as ranchers or, uh, you know, scientists, they want location-specific information. And then, even though the message was a little bit mixed here, they wanted, wanted to be able to find other people to work with, to interact or network with people. Uh, and so looking for tools that would help them do that. And they wanted, as I said, to be able to find those people, those experts, people that could help them answer questions. So these were some of the things that came about out of our needs assessment. And in particular, in the business plan, we were hoping to find some answer to the uh, ongoing problem of how do you keep these projects going. And there, there is no silver bullet, perfect answer. And so we're still in there working to find grants, look for contribution from our partners, and, and sponsorships were some of the recommendations that came uh, out of the, the business plan that we, that we worked on. So <clears throat> those were some of the things that we realized, uh, and this confirmed things that we felt needed to be addressed. And so the opportunity arose in 2010 uh, with a, an international science education grant from USDA. Uh, we went in with our, several of our uh, Rangelands West partners, uh, UC Davis and University of Idaho, and then uh, also brought in uh, Australia and FAO to, to, uh, to go in on this grant. We had other signatories, E-Extension and the Grasslands Society of Southern Africa that were part of that uh, grant proposal. We, we, did, we received the grant. Uh, our proposal objectives, you can see here, uh, pretty much match uh, some of the recommend, most of the recommendations that we got from our needs assessment. We wanted to redesign the portal. We wanted to focus on you know, repository of, of, of full text and quality evaluated resources. We wanted to uh, continue to establish partnerships with organizations or, or uh, professional associations around the world and develop this global rangelands effort. Uh, of course, the infrastructure, the back end part was critical to making it all work, and so we wanted to update, uh, you know, create an infrastructure that would uh, provide fast and, and user friendly access to content. And the search interface, of course, is important in that regard. So we wanted to, to develop faceted search options and, uh, and then the idea of in, implementing social networking applications was part of the uh, proposal objectives as well. We wanted to also develop content for uh, people providing, you know, professors or, or educators in, in the area of rangelands. Uh, so we develop, uh, proposed to develop two learning modules, multimedia, multimedia learning modules, and uh, then synthesis papers on international outreach and extension for natural resources management. So as a result, uh, we, again, this was 2010. We started in late 2010 with the funding, I get, as I recall, and it seemed to like you know forever and ever we were saying we're almost ready to release we're almost ready and finally in uh, last December we were able to release our three new levels of the of the uh, global rangelands rangelands west initiative and so the first is the global rangelands database and uh, then we have we wanted to retain the rangelands west. U.S. regional uh, page that's important f uh, access point for our partners in the U.S. And then at the state level, those 19 land-grant institutions have state pages as well for their state, you know, Arizona rangelands or Hawaii rangelands or Alaska rangelands, Texas rangelands. Uh, all of those partners have state sites. Some of those uh, 
our partners, state partners, are using other th things like lib, lib guides or lib guides, whichever you pronounce. And uh, but we have developed a template at Arizona that can be used by partners who want to to take that approach. And so this is an example of the state template and how we've implemented it for Arizona. So just to highlight some of the things that we, we developed as part of our proposal uh, objectives to meet our objectives, uh, we have developed a, a, a suite of multimedia resources. We've de we created a global rangelands YouTube channel with different areas f focused on climate, uh, domestic and wild animals, uh, economics, fire, invasive species, uh, vegetation monitoring, you can see the list there, but uh, we've collected, you know, identified and evaluated and then uh, provided access to these multimedia uh, videos uh, through the YouTube channel. And we also have uh, identified audio files and photos or images that can be, that relate to that, uh, to rangeland management. The international outreach component of our objectives, we did create a section on uh, global extension practice and includes uh, case studies, participatory approaches, uh, descriptions of use of ICT, information and communication technologies. So again, we, we have been able to really address that objective by creating this component of the global range global rangelands page. Uh, here's an example of on the on global rangelands we have a section uh, on organizations around the world that relate to rangeland uh, science, rangeland management and uh, professional or trade organizations, uh, agencies are all part of this list and uh, we are certainly open and, and welcoming any uh, suggestions if, if you know of others to, to uh, suggest for this uh, listing of organizations related to rangelands. Uh, and one, you know, one thing I, usually I, we include in our introduction that I'll just stop and mention here is we chose rangelands because it, it's a fascinating area to work in. It's so multidisciplinary. It covers public policy, science. Uh, you know, there are really a lot of controversial issues related to grazing and uh, use of, of, the, of the land. And it's a kind of, it's very widespread. Some statistics say that 70% of, of land type worldwide is rangeland, can be considered rangelands, and in the U.S., there's a range of numbers, but you know certainly uh, 36 to 40, up to even some people say 50 or 60 percent of the U.S. is considered rangelands. So it's things like forests, shrublands, grasslands, savannas. It's uh, you know it's uh, it's not just people riding the range, uh, herding cattle. It's it's there's all kinds of use of the rangeland. It's uh, recreation, it's uh, uh, forestry. There's, so again, it's a very diverse area to work in and, and, and interesting and, and challenging in, in many ways. Uh, but lots of organizations that, uh, that have information related to that. We've also created uh, links to events and to news resources. Right now, these link to pages, we are looking to establish RSS feeds so that it's a updated information that people see right, right when they come to the page. Uh, what we've done here is also provide on the Global Rangeland site uh, maps that allow you to see different uh, parts of the world and the kind of uh, ecosystems related to rangelands. And so this illustrates, for example, if you were to click on Australia, you would see that you would get a map then that would show you in Australia the dif different kinds of rangelands in Australia. And then when you picked a particular uh, part of Australia, it would bring up the uh, 
one of the things that we had on our objectives for this project was to uh, bring up the uh, multimedia modules that uh, on particular areas. And so it's called the World Rangelands Learning Experience. Uh, cleverly uh, came up with one of our partners as Wrangell. And uh, so this is the Wrangell site for Aus Australia uh, that th this will then link to uh, for the Australia shrublands that were on that map up there in red. And then that will then take you to a description and a collection of images, interviews with people, all kinds of resources, including for some, not all yet, but some gigapans that allow you to kind of actually see the land in sort of a 360 view. So this was, uh, this is something that we're still under development in terms of the number of, of uh, locations that have this kind of development right now. It's mostly Australia and some North America, uh, but we're, we've got some information for uh, all continents, but not as uh, developed for, uh, for all as for Australia in particular and then uh, North America. So we're pretty proud of this. We have some very creative uh, people working for us. This was, this part of the project was what UC Davis was involved with. A little bit about our collections. We have uh, in global rangelands uh, a number of different collections and uh, again we're trying to really develop the content to represent uh, the global aspect. The, and so I'm going to highlight here the Australia rangelands collection. Uh, we worked with the Australia Rangeland Society, uh, they have a, a number of their symposia, their biennial uh, meetings where they needed or wanted to have those digitized and available online. So uh, we digitized that content and developed it into this Australia Rangelands collection. Uh, and it's a little hard to see, I'm sure, because it's small, but it this shows you how we go from that collection and then we have a search box. You can of course browse the records that have been entered but you can also search on your topic and then uh, it will bring up the record. If you scroll down, you well actually you can see if you were, if it was a little bit bigger, the link to the PDF. And so there you have the full text of that paper. So we're really trying to, again, have the content there when the user searches so that they can link right directly to it. And, and much of this is, uh, n you know, has not been digitized and so this is n new content available, full text online. We are also working on the search capabilities, as I said, uh, you know, faceted searching, being able to refine the search uh, after someone starts with, for example, the topic of restoration. Uh, they, they could do that as a, a search and get uh, results about, I think that says around 200, 200 and almost 300 records but then they can filter, filter by collection, by document type, by Agrivoc keywords, uh, and that allows them to narrow from restoration and from those initial search results uh, using some of the uh, filter options. In this case, we used a, key, a keyword, introduce species, and uh, that brought it down the search results to nine in that particular example. And so again, then they could link to the articles or publications, many of them from the SRM journals, Journal of Range Management or Rangelands. Uh, so that shows you a little bit about our collections and our search options. We're, uh, but this is a, a way that we've developed uh, the My Rangelands allows users to kind of customize their experience as they uh, use the site or sites. And uh, once you've established a My Rangelands account, you can uh, see what your recent searches have been. You can, 
the system will suggest items or resources that may be of interest to you based on your previous searches. And uh, it also allows you, we have the op ability for users to sort of rate or rank their, what the content they've read that they, whether, you know, has as to whether they find it useful or not it, uh, when, when you've set up that account, you, that you have that option to, to, it's not really a thumbs up kind of thing, but it's a plus or if you want to kind of promote or say this has been useful, you can do that. So that's the sort of uh, my rangelands for the external or comprehensive audience or user, but we also have, I wanted, we wanted to show sort of the back end as to uh, the collections, uh, and this would be more for the partners, the people involved in entering records. Uh, this shows, again, a little hard to see, but it's a dashboard. If you are a, have the permissions as a partner or, or contributor, uh, you'll have that dashboard option up on the top bar over there on the upper right that then allows you to edit collections, to add uh, resources. So here's adding content where you, it brings up the metadata record. And we're using modified Dublin Core and uh, with the advice and support of our uh, partners at FAO have you know, worked up the, uh, how we wanted to present that and, and index the, or provide the, the records for that. Uh, and so uh, that, that's a little bit on the back end side, but just uh, to give you a, a view of that as well. And finally, or just to say a little bit more about that, again, we're using uh, the Agrivox system partly because we wanted, again, with the global approach to be able to use, have the multilingual uh, beyond English and Spanish, which are critical and important languages, of course, but uh, we, we, uh, provi it provides automatic indexing as our people creating the records uh, input the terms. It automatically indexes against Agrivoc and suggests that, or gives the option to select from the Agrivoc list of terms. And uh, that, again, is another filtering option, uh, filter by Agrivoc. And uh, so you can see it, it helps people narrow their search. So again, it's important to realize how the benefits of, of controlled vocabulary, of course, uh, provide consistency across m multiple people you inputting records. Uh, it integrates uh, the thesaurus into the workflow by having that automatic uh, su you know, suggestion as people tag records, and uh, it allows us to aggregate relevant contents from other sources uh, via RSS feeds or page scraping, and so that's part of our strategy to really uh, leverage uh, the system there. It also provides, you know, the potential for sharing our contents and, uh, you know, both directions to make uh, uh, easier for us to integrate content from other services and resources, but also make our content reusable by other services using that same uh, Agrivoc thesaurus. And in addition, of course, uh, it maps to other thesauri, such as uh, NALT and Eurovoc and others, uh, so that there's that ability to link and communicate or, or share information. And real quickly, I'll just add that we have, of course, plans for the future. Work is never done when you're doing a web project. Uh, we're going to continue to develop advanced searching capabilities, faceted browsing, uh, having search boxes within each collection. These are things that our users, our partners have suggested, uh, you know, the things that you see, expect, users expect to see from, that they're used to on other databases, in other database searching, ability to export content to bibliographic management systems. Uh, you know, so we have a lot of plans for improvements and, and development, further development. We want the uh, mobile responsive design uh, that 
uh, Dr. Liu referred to people always, you know, looking at their their iPad or their uh, smartphone. Uh, we want it accessible that way as well. And uh, not only to the global site, but to our Rangelands West page. Uh, one of the things we've actually moved forward on recently, uh, we've created a Facebook page, and uh, we are also looking to harvest new content. Uh, we will continue to work with SRM to, to try to continue to add content from their journals and uh, other countries, publications, Australia, and again, uh, the Grassland Society of Southern Africa, International Land uh, Coalition uh, are people that we're in talks with as well. So uh, we just had our annual meeting, the group of uh, the Rangelands, it's now known as the Range, Rangelands Partnership because we, we thought, well, Rangelands West might be a little too geographically limiting, so we want to be inclusive because we are looking to broaden to a, a global effort. And so our, at our annual meeting in Anchorage uh, in May, uh, we met, this is just part of the group, but we had, uh, again, people from Australia, Mexico, as well as our partners from ar around the country. Uh, and so it's an ongoing project. We welcome any suggestions or ideas you have from countries that you know that have rangelands information or rangeland information needs. And we encourage you to take a look and like us on Facebook and keep up with us that way. So uh, I will conclude and open the floor for questions for either presentation. We're uh, bumping up against the break, so we'll just take maybe one or two questions if there are any, and please go to the mic so that we can all hear your question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you. I had a, a question about the rangelands and whether it includes the possibility to um, connect to data or search for data sets or um, whether that's incorporated? Well, we recognize that as a, an area that really is, as everyone uh, knows, is the growing part of how researchers are, are doing their work. And it's certainly, I think, in our plans at this point, we don't have uh, direct harvesting or, or data sets that are in our back-end database. We have, uh, uh, so I would say that's definitely a, in the future, and I would invite Barb or, or Valeria or, to comment further uh, specifically on that. But uh, it, at this point, I would not at, at this time uh, the, the, in the current database of, of content that we have. It's in the works, Barb. I would just say that one of the things that we're looking at more is that it's using that in terms of our mobile apps and collecting field data. So that's going to be the first step, and then hopefully that will build to a larger data set. So that's our phase one. <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry, still on the rangelands. I'm quite interested in the in the fact that you've uh, you've looked you've described the global the Rangeland West and the, you have the um, state uh, portals. Uh, the question I have is how did you ensure interoperability and linkages uh, among those three levels of uh, portals? Um, yeah. you know, is it automated? And you know, I'm, I'm more interested in the way you designed the, the three portals so that they would in interrelate and integrate. Yeah? Um, right. So, well, just two other smaller questions. Are your video materials also indexed using your AgroVoc terms? Yeah, and there was a, there's a question I'm asking myself. There's a presentation during this uh, World Congress about access agriculture. Someone from Benin is presenting. It's a kind of YouTube agri uh, channel for agriculture. 
whether we could also think about um, using that channel instead of all going to YouTube. And then why the Facebook page only for Rangeland the West? Yes. And why did you not start with the global? Because yes. I thought that was we a had better a, point. Maybe yeah. I'll start with that first because we just were talking about that this last week. We, you know, we thought maybe we should change the name of that page before we talk this week because uh, it really is intended to uh, be for the the whole initiative, not just the Rangelands West, which kind of focuses it more on uh, the U.S. Or so uh, that's definitely under discussion, uh, but it is intended to be something that brings the, all three levels together. Maybe I'll skip back to the first question, and I'll certainly invite uh, Valeria or Barb to add to this. But I, and I didn't really describe this well at the beginning, but it is, there, it's all three levels are unified by the back-end database. There's this, uh, it, we call it the Global Rangelands Database, and the state sites, they can, they can choose to include records, they can input their records into that database, so I would say at this point maybe not as many of the records or resources on the state sites are in the database, uh, but the uh, range, you know, the broader Rangelands West is c connected by that back-end database. And uh, then uh, I don't know, again, if, if you want to add anything, Valeria or anybody, but uh, Barb. Uh, Valeria. The ontology. Okay, the basic technology, the, the platform is built on Drupal and uh, the contents, all the, most of the state websites are also built on Drupal, so it's quite easy to integrate contents. Besides that, they have common taxonomies, so the contents are indexed using the same tax taxonomies, same ontologies. They use Agrovox, so integrating the contents is not difficult at the three levels, the state, uh, west, and uh, global. And for external resources like FAO and Australia, etc., again, using Agrovoc and importing the contents into Drupal in a structured way is not difficult. So yeah, everything is integrated and interoperable. Mm -hmm. And I may have missed one of your in-between questions, but uh, follow, you can follow up later. <laughs> from Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. Since you are talking about the global range, uh, rangeland, uh, I, I don't think it's so global as it doesn't include the uh, China grassland, uh, which, which may cover one quarter of the global rangeland. So do you have any idea or, or, or future plan um, on how to cooperate with uh, China and other areas in the world? As far as I know, uh, there's a, um, in, Grassland Institute in uh, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, which uh, which has very rich database and uh, resources. So, have any idea? Uh, so, do you have any? Well, I, I think I'll let Barb answer that because we have uh, been in contact, and Barb has worked with folks. She was in China uh, just a year ago. So, Barb, you want to talk about this a little more? <laughs> I, first, I want to say is one of the reasons that it's exciting to be here is that we're hoping to have just these kinds of conversations. I actually have a Skype uh, scheduled for when I go home um, that through a colleague at Cornell, I, had to, I gave a presentation about this at USDA for the ISC grant uh, project directors, and one of the uh, Cornell professors who was there was just going to China and his, has a very good colleague friend who's a range specialist there, a range scientist. So we are having a Skype conversation when I get back just about this, that we really want to get China involved. And um, so we, it isn't that we haven't wanted more partners from around the world. It's just a lack of time and energy and resources. But as we go to conferences like this and we make connections, that's how we um, that's how we got the, uh, somebody said, get in touch with a, a range professor at the University of Hermosillo in Mexico, and that turned into now a major collaboration. So 
hopefully eventually we'll come back here in three or five years and we will have the world, uh, and we will have uh, all of the organizations, or at least many um, more uh, as part of our partners. But th that is why we're here. We would love to partner with as many uh, range uh, organizations around the world as possible. So yes, absolutely. China's high on our list. We will talk more. <laughs> okay. Hi, this is a question for uh, Lotus Shaw. Um, I recall your presentation at uh, a previous EL Congress which, about, which touched on the challenges of, of uh, getting students to use anything um, apart from you know, the standard search engines to do searches. Um, are we fighting a losing battle on this? You know, I, I'm, I should probably declare I'm Martin Parr, I'm from Cabby, so you know, we've got sort of a vested interest in this. You, know, you said there's a lot of interesting stuff um, in our databases. Those databases are available for your students to use, and yet there continues to be um, you know, a barrier for them to get access to it, even though they're entitled to use it. What do we need to do to help you to, to make that material more obvious to them or them to see the value in it? The, um, I said hi. Oh, um, well, you know, our libraries, we subscribe to a lot of resources and um, our users are Google and Google Scholar users. You know, that's the first place they go. And um, in my institutions, we do hundreds of instruction. And there, ought, you know, there should be the, this gap, uh, which we all in our institutions tend to do, so that we get, bridge this gap. You know? It's as if, if we don't do this instruction, it's as if you're being, building a reservoir and not pouring this, sending it through pipes to the users. So I think um, you all, Kabi is doing a good job of, of, I mean, I'm the advisory board, and so we, always bash and <laughs> telling them what they need to do and they do it. Most times they do it and they bring this research, you know, they bring very good um, resources. Um, also, um, if you don't educate the users, then our users will still be Google scholars. I have had several assessments in my instruction for last year and we did assessment before we do instruction and assessment after we do instruction. And before we do assess, before we do instruction, even even though they had a library instruction session before, one of the place, and you ask them, where will you go first for information? And the first place they go is Google. And so we say, okay, well, if you have to go there, then Google Scholar is a better source. Might as well use Google Scholar for scholarly material. And these are undergraduate students, of course, the mass, vast majority of them. Um, the graduate students also I mean, even though we have um, graduate students, there is also this need of training and showing them the resources, and especially the resources which are specific to their subject areas. Um, when they do know about it, even though they use these resources on the web, they, they will go to their own resources. And then certainly the faculty do have a love for their material and their resources when they get it. But um, there is also, um, you know, we have to keep educating students because they come and they go. And, and um, publishers also can help because if they make their databases as to maybe have the same Google-like effect that students are accustomed to, and they can also link the, from the databases to Google Scholar and to many other those other resources because there is one for libraries to keep subscribing to these major databases, and we always have to justify why we subscribe into this and what it has. So, and also, um, the full text that we subscribe to. If they, nowadays, cost per use is a big thing in our academic libraries, and if the journals are not used, then they will get canceled. If the databases are not used, they will get canceled. So um, if, if these vendors allow linkage and all the you know, to different resources on the web, then what's not in their database, our users can then automatically jump over to these other things and search. Even though they search those, they could get back to our full text resources because you know, through our IP recognition and whatever in campus. 
So it's all, not only the publishers, we want content because we want to pay. When we pay for content, it should be unique content because we cannot pay for this stuff in several ways. But once we get the content, then we have to channel it to our users and make sure they know that there is not like bridging, you know, building a pool and not, or, or a reservoir of water that people want to drink, but don't tell them the water is there and don't get the water to them, then our resources will not be used. Okay, let's thank our panelists. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.